praise you for your presence in our lives, and we thank you, Lord, that you are available to us. We thank you that you have a plan. Just what a wonderful uh, reminder of the fact that you are God and you are good, and you've got it worked out. And may we come to you, Lord, in all things. We ask you to bless this next session and speak to our hearts, speak to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, flip on up to chapter 16, same book of Acts. Please. Let's pick it up at verse 19. No, let's go back up to 16. <clears throat> and it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of him that same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of her gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of, the, out of his sleep, and <clears throat> seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Then he called for light and sprang in and came trembling. And he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved and your house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his, all his straightway. And when they had brought them into the house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Father, I pray for just the next few minutes you'd open up our hearts and teach us some things that we need to know. Maybe rekindle some some sparks in our lives, Lord, or bring us back to something that we know and, and uh, reignite us, God. But teach us what you want us to learn from these words, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, how we love you. In your name, Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to see one reason that God does allow things to happen in our lives. There's an incident here. These guys are in a very, very, very tough situation, aren't they? They're beaten with stocks. They're thrown in prison. They've got whippings on the back, you know. That has to cause bruising and tearing of the, of the flesh and, and bleeding. And probably, you know, some organs are touched and maybe bones broken. I mean, it was an easy thing. You know, then they're put back in these stocks where they would put and they would separate their legs as far as they could. So the pain was excruciating. You know, they're in a, in a terrible, terrible position. 
and they were experiencing all these things, you know, because of God. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, that's how God lived. There was a verse, let me see, Philippians, let me see if I can find it here. I don't think, I, maybe I didn't write the verse down, maybe I did. Um, You don't have to turn there if you want to. Philippians 1. Verse 2. Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father, Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy. This is how this man thought. He prayed for them constantly and prayed for people that, that they would be okay and that, that they were fine and that's, that's how he lived. I want to notice a, a couple of things here, all right? How can you worship God at a time like this? I mean, just how is that possible? I mean, how can you sing songs of worship and prayers? There are sometimes I have to repent that I, I go into the worship service, you know, the time before I'm going to teach or something, or I'm someplace and, I'm, and, and there's worship, and I love worship. I could listen to worship all the time. I just I worship when it stops at a certain We need more worship. Go, let's do more. I just love worship, man. But how do you worship and praise? There's times I've walked in and I've got something heavy, and I just, God, you know, and I'm just mumbling to myself, and, and I don't feel like worshiping, but it has nothing to do with feelings. It shouldn't have anything to do with feelings. It has to do with my choices and, and my attitudes. How can you do this when things are so bad? There is only one way, and that way is that we need to know that he is with us, and he never changes, period. That's how I live. I live in this way that God is with me, and no matter what's going on, he never changes. And I believe that's exactly what, what Paul was saying. I'm thinking that verse I read to you is not the verse that I wanted. It was a good verse. It may help you sometime, but it had nothing to do with what I'm going to say. I think... All right, yes, it's verse 12 of that same chapter in Philippians. But I would that you should understand, brothers, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. That's the way Paul lived, that whatever happened, there was a purpose in that, that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he had resurrected from the dead, that there was salvation in him, that our sins were taken by him. That, that truth, the furtherance of that truth, he said, everything I've gone through, every situation, every beating, every stripe, everything I've experienced has furthered the gospel. I, I have people ask me all the time, and I'm sure you do that, you know, where was God when, where was God when, you know, he was there. He doesn't cause the destruction. We live in a sin-filled world, man. And choices and decisions that mankind has made has caused all the destruction and all the sin and all the disease and all of that. And the good news is, my perspective is heaven. And good news is, that's coming for me. And that's coming for all of us. But you've... But, but to live in such a way that all of a sudden, maybe you're in a, a nice Bible study or you're, you're worshiping well and you feel good, things are good for you. You just, your job is happening and, and uh, things are good at home and your kids are, are great. And what happens when all of a sudden the bad news happens about that kid? He's not that great. Oh, what happens when you walk into the job you've had for eight years and the boss said, I'm sorry, man, we're cutting back and, and you got to go, man. And you start hearing all of these things. And what happens? Has God changed? Is he not in the same place he always was? He's there. 
And that's how Paul could, could live that way. You know, he's always there, always in control. So they had this attitude of worship. They had this attitude of being able to be all stretched out and, you know, bleeding all over the place and all this stuff. They had this attitude of worship. And Paul looks at Silas and say, what was that worship song you were teaching me? You wrote a couple days ago. How did that go, man? You know, and uh, they just begin to sing worship songs. First, that boggles my mind, and I thought, no, I should be doing that. And I find myself, you know, now I, I still, I sing a lot, but by myself, Kevin, I never sing in public. He told me, please don't ever do that, especially when I'm around. He said, don't do that. And so I don't, but when I'm by myself, I'm singing, man. I'm, I'm, I'm driving, wherever I'm driving, man, I'm, I'm singing. Just be praising no matter what's, what's going on, because... There's an awareness of his presence when I'm worshiping. And, and Paul and Silas were able to do that. They also had an attitude, not just an attitude of worship, but I, I believe they had an attitude of trust. And like I said at the last service, let me say it again, last study, but let me say it again. I believe that my greatest times of ministry have always come out of my, my greatest times of suffering. Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan wrote that in prison. Martin Luther wrote the Bible so common man could understand while he was held hostage in a castle. Paul wrote what? Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon, Philemon, First and Second Timothy, all from jail. And it wasn't, you know, the, the simple house arrest jail, man. He was under control, and he read all that. Every time I read Philippians, I cry. When I read the first chapter of Philippians, the first few verses of Philippians, I live in Philippians because it, it is so real to me because here's a man in prison talking about joy. And I go, get a life. <laughs> I'm not in prison, but I'm not real joyful right now. And he just begins to speak to my heart. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Your strength is not your friends or, you know, your prayer times or all those things are good, but the joy of the Lord, just realizing that I can worship him and praise him and he's with me constantly. I just got laid off or I just got this happened or I just got this news or this is going on. The joy of the Lord is my strength in that. It's not, oh man, now I'm going to really go through it. Lord, I don't know what's happening, but... Paul, Silas, move over. I'm going to be singing with you right now. In the midst of that news I just heard, in, in the result of that phone call that just hit me like a brick, I'm going to sing to you right now. That's what it means to trust God. That phone call is terrible, but I'm not dictated to by that phone call or what I was told. I'm surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ and I want to be able, like Paul, to be able to write to you and say, I count all things as joy. I can worship him. I can trust him. No matter what just hit me, I can trust him. You know, where, where we live and the church and where all of us, we're, we're Fred and Libby, you know, we're expecting a, a storm this afternoon and all day tomorrow. So we may move here. We may not be able to go home. So I just want to let you know we're going to, be staying at different houses different nights, so just let me know the address. Yeah. But, um, you know, and, and, and so the people know that, and I expect them to care about that, but to rejoice at the same time because they've been taught this, they know this in the Word. And, and we just all need to be reminded because this thing has never happened before, you know. We're, we're, we're in the desert, and we... We, we pride ourselves. We don't have tornadoes and we just have earthquakes and all the poor people over there and all of a sudden we got a tornado coming. <laughs> and what are we going to do? And so it's, that's why we came up here because we were afraid. No, there's joy in the midst. I want that joy. I want that joy constantly. I want people to be able to look at me and say, Jesus is real. I've had people come up to me 
over the last few years and say, thanks for just being who you are. In the midst of the trials you've gone through, you showed us that Christ is real. You've shown us that that joy is, is available. We see your hurt, we see your pain, but we see your relationship with Jesus. And that's got to be what life is all about, man. And for Paul, it was all about that next guy, that next person, that next lady, finding a relationship with Jesus Christ. That was his goal. I really want us to get there somehow. We praise because of who he is. You know, we're, we're, t- t- tomorrow night's going to be a concert. And it's, it's all about scripture and scripture. And I'm so anxious about that because I've had this CD and I've listened to it over and over. And I'm anxious to be with a whole bunch of people that are just praising God. And that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be praising the Lord. I'm not coming to listen to a concert. And the concert's going to be great. But I'm coming to, to, to be in the presence of, of God and rejoice with a whole room full of people doing the same thing. Man, that's, that's the purpose for writing those things, man. That's, that's those things. They were beautiful hymns, not those things. But, you know, for us to be in his presence, I love that. That's why I love praise. I told you I love praise because I'm in his presence. Every time there's praise, I'm, in, I'm, 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 in, I'm involved. I love Bible studies because I'm, I'm learning something. Every time I'm in the word, I'm, I'm learning something. The first way to see God, no, the easiest way, the fastest way to see God is to move our eyes off of the circumstances back onto God and into eternity. We must see things not only for God's plan for us, but his plan for others. So, so important. Let me look at this event from a totally different perspective, okay? I believe that when you've had an experience, an encounter with God, that you're never the same. Now, we can hide it. We can push it down. But when you experience something from God, when you're reading the Word, and all of a sudden, that verse jumps out at you, and you go, that was written just for me. That's an encounter. That's a revelation from God. And when we get revelations that we know that God has delivered to us, nobody can ever take that away from us again. And I've, I've experienced this through, through Philippians and, and through what we're reading now, I've experienced a joy that nobody is going to take away from me because it's the joy of the Lord that's there. And so when all of a sudden I hear something and I get that phone call and, you know, I just got it night before last and I, <laughs> I was supposed to meet somebody for, for dinner uh, the night before we left. And, and Wednesday, Wednesday night, Thursday night, whatever, we left Friday, right? So it was Thursday night and I got a phone call. They couldn't make it. I'm at, I'm at the restaurant already. And I said, okay, we'll meet next week sometime. That's fine. And I got a phone call five minutes after that from this family with this girl I talked about. And she's, they said, Julia's in really bad shape and she's in such pain. And uh, can, can you come and just pray with us? And they've just moved to our area. I've known them for years, but in a different situation. I, they were attended a church in Ramona that... I'm good friends with the pastor there, and I've spoken there many, many times. And they from there, so they moved to our area because of the mold and all that stuff. And so they called me, and I haven't even been to their house yet. And, and so I said, yeah, of course I can. So I just, you know, so God canceled the one, one thing and something else, and I got up there, and um, it was, I'm, I'm driving up there, and I saying, God, I love, I love these people so much. I knew this girl when she was this big, and now she's 20 years old, and she's so sick and so gorgeous in her heart and loves the Lord so much. 
and God, I don't even know what to, what to do. And I was getting sad. And the Lord just reminded me, put your eyes back on me. And the way I put my eyes back on him, I'm not trying to get a vision of him. I always put my eyes back on, on him. Now, they're going to talk about that later. I'm talking about a lot of stuff later. Later is going to be really long. But I, I, I've learned that I look towards eternity. That's how I get my eyes back on God. I look towards heaven, and I realize this is not all there is. He's prepared something better for me. He's prepared something better for Julia. He's prepared, prepared something better for her parents. And Lord, I can trust you. And as soon as I get my eyes back on heaven, that, hey, I've got just, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm an old man now, and I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. But you know what? Hallelujah. I'm just going to keep walking towards heaven. And, and whatever I do in the meantime, I'm just going to keep walking towards heaven. And if I have this tragedy and that hurt and this situation, and so I prayed for them on the way up there, and I was singing on the way up there, and I got there, and Julia's, Julia's up walking around. And, she's, and I said, why, what, what are you doing? You're supposed to be sick. Lay down. I'm supposed to pray for you. And you'll get healed after I pray for you. Okay? That's my job. <laughs> And she says, no. She said, I prayed for myself and I feel fine. Thank you very much. And I said, oh, wow. And so the whole family, the, the mom and dad came in and Julia sat down in the living room and I sat down. And we spent the next two hours just talking about Jesus. <laughs> what he's done in their lives, what he's done in my life, who he is, what he's about. And, and, and Julia was one. She says, let me tell you a story. This is the one that's sick. And she said, I'm a perfectionist. I've been a perfectionist all my life. She's put herself through high school, online, since she's been sick. She's put herself through college, and she's about to, to, to graduate. And uh, all online while she's sick. And she got her first B in her last class in college. She has never gotten a B in her life. Okay, never. And she got this B on something that she wrote in, in the English class or something in her term paper. And so she called her professor and said, excuse me, why, why did I get a B for this? He said, you misspelled one word and you missed a comma that it should have been there. And she said, well, that's not the way you said you were going to grade. He said, it's a B and that's final. He says, okay. So she went in, she dove into depression. First she wanted to, you know, she wanted to go into her, 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 her graduate studies and stuff and, and, you know, with a perfect score. And um, she was in, her mom was in the room and she was, Julia was just weeping. She had just had that call. Mom walked out, she was so sad for her. 10 minutes later, her mom walked back in and there's a super smile on her face. And she said, what happened to you? She said, I was sitting here, and she always listened to worship music, and a new song came on. Uh, I think it was by Brandon Lake and uh, um, Phil Wickham, something about people in heaven. I haven't even heard it yet. And it, was, it was brand new, and they do it together. And it was, she said, all of a sudden, I got the words of the song that I can view heaven as already being there. People are there like me, and I'm going to be there too in that, in that place. And then she said, God began to speak to my heart and saying, I gave you the B. I gave that to you. And she said, why would you do that? Because you need to know that you're no longer to seek perfection. You're to seek me. And you've gotten distracted seeking your perfection instead of seeking me. And I have a plan for your life. And you need to really seek me now. And she just was set free. And I'm sitting there. Why I was called there was to hear that story. It wasn't to, you know, pray for her. It was to hear that story. That this girl now is set free. Still got the disease. Still whatever. But God showed her. I have a plan for you. We don't know what that is. But it's a plan. And it's right and it's perfect. And it was a distraction. Her grades were a distraction. 
Her perfection was a strip. She said it'd be perfect and everything. Had to have the right clothes on. The shoes had to match a certain way. And the, I mean, the hair, it was just everything. She said, her mom said she drove me nuts all of her life. The toys in her room had to be, you know, she would, had everything had to be perfect. And God said, you're, you're, you're worshiping your perfection. And you need to worship me. You need to turn your, you need to turn your life back, back, totally. She, he was saying, I know you love me. That's not the question. The question is, what's your idol? Anything that distracts us from God is an idol. We, we think of idols as the statues and all that stuff. But anything that distracts us from our purpose for living becomes an idol. And I, I think that that's, that's what I'm, I'm seeing here in, in Paul, you know. Paul wasn't worried. Paul wasn't worried at all. Why? Because he tells us in, in the Gospels, I mean, in his letters, he was a bond slave. He knew who he was. He'd, he'd sold it, so he did surrender and sell it. He surrendered his soul to Jesus. He was a bond slave. His, ears was, his ear was pierced. He wasn't going anywhere. He was that bond slave for the rest of his existence. So if this was the last night, because he knew James had been killed. The same guy probably was in the same prison. And the next morning when he came out, he was killed. So Peter knew that. And well, also Peter knew that he was a bond slave. And if he was taken out and killed, he was, he was seeing heaven. And if he's going to stay around, he was seeing heaven. He knew. Do you remember the... Uh, let me, let me, we got to get there, man. We got to see that. Uh, turn to uh, where do I want you to go. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Chapter 11. Okay. Second Corinthians. Chapter 11. And let's work down to a verse. Uh, we'll start with verse 23. All right. He's writing the church of Corinth. And he says, are they ministers of Christ, people bragging about themselves? He says, I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more than abundant, in stripes more measure, above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes except one. So he was beaten five times with 39 lashings. Lashings would kill most people. 39 lashings. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Three times I suffered shipwrecked. A night and a day. 48 hours he was, you know, in the Mediterranean. I've been in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils of mine own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which comes to me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak that I'm not weak? Who is offended? I don't burn out. And on and on and on. And so this is the guy I'm talking about. This is the guy who's, who is, he has the credentials to say we can rejoice in all things. He has her credentials to say that we can go through sufferings like he and Silas were. They were committed to one thing. They were committed to the gospel. He says to the Philippians in chapter two, I think it's around verse 17. He says, if, 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 I, if I die because of you, I rejoice. That's paraphrase, but that's what he says. If dealing with you, I die, I rejoice because I love you that much. Here's, here's my point. Paul was reckless because he saw himself as expendable. So they kill me tomorrow. So what? I'm... I'm expendable. I'm a bond slave. Who am I? 
I'm expendable. It's all about you, God. So I'm okay. I don't mean anything. I love that. We just read everything he went through. Man, if that was one of us, we'd be doing the circuit right now, wouldn't we? Oh, this is what I went through. And then blah, 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 blah. And they were, oh, filled crowds of people listening to what we said. This guy said, I'm expendable. I just, it's, it's okay, you know, if I die. Evangelism, see my, I just want to take this a little curve here. Because I believe there was one purpose for this event. And I say, we don't always see purposes. And most of the time we don't, but I see one here. There's a purpose for this whole event of them being arrested and everything else. And I believe that was evangelism. Evangelism begins for us. When we're put in circumstances, we may, we may not like, but God works it out. That's where evangelism begins. All of a sudden, there begins to be something. I don't like this circumstance, but all of a sudden, this circumstance. You've told me experience of some of these guys that are here right now. You told me the circumstances before everything happened. And circumstances brought about evangelism. That circumstance, we didn't like the circumstance. Maybe we didn't even like knowing that person or knowing that situation or whatever, but all of a sudden, we're talking about Jesus. All of a sudden, there's something happening. And somebody's beginning to ask questions. And then evangelism starts. Look at verse 25. I forgot where we are. We're in uh, Acts 16, right? Look at verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, and so the foundations of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let me give you, we'll continue in a minute. Let me give you what I think would be Paul's philosophy about rejoicing. There's two things I just want you to get in this time. We're just about done. Rejoicing and evangelism. Let's look at rejoicing for a minute. I think I want you, I want you to hear from, from, other, from other writings of Paul, what, how he looks at rejoicing. Rejoicing the Lord always because God's in charge. I think that's, he, that's one of his philosophies about rejoicing. I can rejoice because he's in charge. Secondly, because he always works things out for our good. So Paul wrote about that later. So I can rejoice because he's not only always there, but he always works things out. He's always in charge and he works things out. And, and, all of it, and also, thirdly, because I'm born again, because I'm saved. And I'm his, I'm no longer mine. See, it's not a, it's, it's not a cooperation, it's, it's, not a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a partnership when Jesus comes into our lives. It's, it's not me and God, it's not a partnership. God says, I'll do this, you do that. God says, I'll do everything, and I'll show you what to do, and then I do it. It's, he's in charge. It's, it's a one-man show. It's him. It has to be. How many times have I gone to say, you've done enough now, let me take over? You ever done that? You know, and then you fall flat on your face. Thank you, God. Can I come back and we can start all over again? He says, of course, because that's who he is. And I think another reason is because... Um, I'm going to heaven. You know, you know but here's, here's my philosophy about heaven. I think more about there now than I do this. And I used to think about this more than I did there. Making sense to you? So I think more about there than I ever used to think about. And it's changed my life. 
because I look at this mess and say, praise God. I'm going to get out of here. It's going to be somebody else's mess. <laughs> you know? It's, I just think about it. I think about heaven. And, well, I'm going to see one day. I'm, I'm going to see Michelle. I'm going to see my mom and dad. I'm going to see my grandparents. I'm going to see hundreds of people I've buried over 50 years, man. It's just going to be so, and I'm going to be there. But the best thing I'm going to see is the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to, oh, that's, just don't get me started on that. Because that's where I'm going, and that's where we're all going. God is good. We say this, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. But I want to tell you, until you really believe God is good all the time, you're not going to make it in the peace that you need. God is good all the time. So you can tell me this girl sickness, God is good all the time. Your family dying, God is good all the time. I have a couple of diseases that, one of, that's why the walker, I always keep it there, or Fred, one of the two, that's always been there. And, and um, you guys, I have tremors that you don't know when they're coming, and, and my legs will just start, you know, kicking out. And if you're close, you get kicked, and I, I apologize. But, but God is still good all the time, right? God is good. I woke up this morning not feeling good at all. I woke up this morning, and I was shaking, and I was dizzy, and I, I told Fred, I just, let's pray. We prayed, and, and uh, Kevin came and prayed with us, and I, you know, I just know that it was just something, but God is good all the time. And I know that I was supposed to come because I had a couple of things that I believe you needed to hear, and I need to hear again. I'm, I'm nothing different than you are, you know, just seeing heaven and, and worshiping him and praising him and let him, you know. Paul didn't know there was going to be an earthquake. Paul didn't know that. Paul didn't know that the chains were going to fall off of everybody. He didn't know that. He didn't know that the gates were going to open. He didn't know that. All he knew was he was chained next to Silas, and they were worshiping God. And he knew God was there. And all of a sudden, there's an earthquake. A miraculous thing that just began to happen. That's the way we have to live. We have to live in such a way that no matter, God's there no matter what's going on. And that's just easy evangelism. You know, he came to and said, what must I do to be saved? That's easy evangelism, man. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. There we go, boom. And, that's, and it happened because the event, God allowed the event and used the event to bring salvation to this man, to his whole family. And Paul got a free meal at the end. Or Peter got a free meal at the end. This is Paul. Paul got a free meal at the end. It's just, and, and that's all I wanted to tell you today. I want to tell you two things. I want to tell you, keep your perspective on God. Keep your eyes on God. Rejoice in him always. He's never left. He's there right now in the midst of that thing. Maybe you're thinking, but Chuck, where is he right now in this thing in my life? He's where he's always been. He's right there, and he's right here. Amen. And he's making all the decisions, and every decision he makes is right. And just accept it. And then the second thing I wanted you to know, that as you go through those things, God is going to open doors to let people know that God exists. Because that's our purpose for being here. Our purpose for being here is not just to get this thing fixed, not just to get this healed, not just to get them healed, not just to make this go away. That's not our purpose here. Our purpose here is to be the witness of Jesus Christ. We are to take Jesus every place we go and let him be revealed through us. How we live, decisions we make. You know how many people be attracted to us if we truly did rejoice in all things 
as Paul says, if we did that, if in every situation just we, you know, people watch us or, you know, you're in the market and something happens and instead of just, you know, I'm, you know, you just, <laughs> that's so cool. You know, people are going to see that. And eventually somebody's going to ask you a question. And it'll boggle your mind what begins to happen. Because we need to be available. Because God wants to use it. He's got it, like I told you before, he has a plan for your life, and he's going to complete that plan. He's going to complete it with you. He's going to walk it out. And in the meantime, rejoice. Focus on heaven. Focus on what's coming. Think about that more than this. What's going on now? And be available to be used. There's people around you that are going to get saved because you just begin to walk in the fullness of what God wants for your life. Father, I thank you for simple truths. But Lord, we are simple people and we forget stuff so, so quickly. I just ask that you would help all of us, including me, especially me, Lord. Keep my focus on you. Keep my focus on on where I'm going and not where I've been or where I am. But keep my focus on you. Be confident, no matter what my situation is, like, like Paul and Silas were, Lord. Be, let me be confident. Let us be confident with chains on us, with hurts in our bodies. Be confident that you are God and the earthquake's going to happen. Let us be quick to recognize those times when we're to speak, those times where we're to live in such a way that you would be revealed to those around us, Lord. Let us be you, your, your witness. Help us to introduce people to you as we walk through this life, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okie dokie. Oh, man. Uh, I just, a, a couple things. What's so cool about this, I know that the Lord speaks to you guys personally through this. I know that, that when I teach, you know, you know, half, 